One way to get around the need for traditional hardware-based tokens is via what we call paper-based tokens. And, and this is an interesting idea, though I think it has a number of both uh, benefits and drawbacks, and then I'll go into those. Uh, but first, let me actually describe the underlying scheme. And, and again, I'll stress here that there may be many ways to implement a scheme based on paper tokens uh, at a low level, but I think there are going to be more or less variations on, on theme of this of the high-level themes I present here. So hopefully, um, this will give you a flavor for how most of these schemes work, although I suspect there will be some subtle differences here and there. So the idea is instead of distributing a physical token that contains a computing device and, and so on and so forth, what you would do is, is uh, you distribute a piece of paper, a piece of paper, and this paper has on it, let's say, a grid of some sort, and, and maybe uh, uh, the grid has uh, a bunch of letters and numbers on it, or maybe other kinds of symbols, maybe words, uh, things of that nature. So you can imagine a, a paper with a bunch of boxes, and then the boxes have numbers and letters, so you know, 1, A, and B, and so on, and 2, 3, and, and this, would be, this would be somewhat more random looking. You wouldn't have any kind of rhyme or reason to to the way this particular box looks, all right? Now, this would be, a, the token would be this piece of paper. The server on the other side, that's the server that you're trying to authenticate yourself to, the server itself would have within it, it would have knowledge of the same piece of paper, although it would, have, it would have an electronic equivalent of it inside of itself, all right? Or maybe instead of having an electronic equivalent, it could have imagined a, um, a key that can be used to generate this paper. So really, at the end of the day, the main thing is the server would have knowledge um, of the contents of this paper, and it would have knowledge of the exact contents of this paper for a particular user. All right? Now, when a user, let's say you have a user, Joe, and, and he tries to log in, so what's going to happen is, is Joe wants to log into a server, and he has his computer, and he's going to want to connect his computer to the server. What the server is going to basically do is ask him questions effectively about this piece of paper, okay? And we can think of these questions as a kind of a challenge. Okay, the server will say, here's a challenge for you. And the challenge might be pretty simple. It might be, hey, what are the contents of you know, this cell, this cell, and this cell on this paper? Okay, maybe a few more cells, all right? Or maybe it'll be something a bit more convoluted, like it may have, it may have Joe kind of walk around this paper and identify certain, certain items on that paper, all right? And then what Joe has to basically do is respond to this challenge by providing, let's say, the contents or some version of the contents of the cells on this paper. So maybe, let's say, this box, let's say, had a five in it. Uh, maybe this box had a, had a two in it, and this box maybe had a, had a seven in it, and so on. And, and maybe many boxes will, will be asked about, but let's keep it simple. So imagine the response is five, two, seven, all right? And what Joe is going to do is, in addition to 527, he has to also provide his username and password because we're talking about two-factor authentication. So the, the password is, is this something he knows. And then the, the response to the challenge is basically a proof of that he has that paper. So it's the something he has part of the, the authentication equation. All right. Now, the server will basically then check. It'll look at the response. It'll check the username and password as it would have before. And then it's going to check based on its copy or its encoding of the paper in its computer's memory it's going to check if Joe provided the correct answer to the challenge. It's going to see that did Joe indeed provide 5, 2, and 7. And if Joe did not provide 5, 2, and 7, Joe would not be allowed access to the service. If he did provide 5, 2, and 7, then he, there's an indication that, uh, that Joe provided the right value. And really, the, the high-level idea is that um, because the paper is, is kind of random-looking or was generated in some type of a pseudo-random fashion, it would be really hard for any you know, adversarial party to, to guess the contents of those specific locations on that grid that, uh, that the, the, the server challenged about. And it would be hard to guess those contents without access to the actual physical card or the grid or the mechanism by which those contents were generated. So effectively what we have then is, is the user's ability to correctly answer the server's challenge in many ways constitutes a proof, if you will, that the user possesses the underlying card, and that in turn would satisfy this something you have requirement that we, we talk about within the context of authentication. Now, I think there are some drawbacks to this scheme, and I, it's worth pointing some of those drawbacks out because I, I think some of them are more noteworthy. Uh, the big drawback is that, one, is you still have to distribute the paper. It's not like you've eliminated the distribution problem. You're still distributing stuff. You're just not distributing a hardware token. 
Um, it, it may be easier to distribute paper because you can potentially email out a PDF and maybe password protect it or something along those lines. So you don't have to maybe physically mail somebody the actual physical piece of paper. It could be done via email or some electronic means, but still there is a mail aspect of it as well or, or distribution aspect of it as well. Uh, you may also have to deal with usability issues. Obviously, this is a grid. The user has to be able to interpret the computer's instructions and the challenge and has to look up a bunch of things on the grid. And, and, and that's actually a bit more cumbersome. It's got an added degree of complexity to it. And a lot of times, users don't deal well with added complexity. So they may make more mistakes, and that can lead to support calls and, and other nightmares of, of, of that sort. Okay, And this is also a third drawback. And I think this third drawback has to do more with the, the long-term security of the scheme, okay? There's a security drawback as well, and, and what is that? Well, you know, effectively, if you think about it, all the schemes I've described so far for doing two-factor authentication really, at a very high level, involve computing some type of a function, and we've called this the hash function, H, and this hash function basically is computed on a few different inputs. It's computed on the, the key K, which is supposed to be secret, and a challenge, okay? And then that results in a token value that is then entered by the user. Now, you know, at a high level, every scheme I've actually presented so far really does have this, this higher level form, okay? In the case of hardware tokens, or even software tokens for that matter, this function H is a cryptographic hash function, all right? So it's a strong function. It's something that's very solid from a cryptographic point of view. And it turns out that a good cryptographic hash function, if it's got kind of the right properties would provide the, the requisite security criteria or properties that you actually need for maintaining security in a scheme like this. Now, uh, just to quickly recall, the challenge itself, uh, that, that can be either one that is freshly generated by the server as in a challenge response protocol. It can also be something that's mutually agreed upon, like the, the current time taken to the nearest minute. All right. Uh, but in either case, the hash function, this function H, is expected to satisfy certain security properties. If you use a soft token or a hardware token, you can implement a hash function that is complex enough to have those requisite properties. But for a paper-based token, one that's based, let's say, on a grid, you're effectively still computing a function, and you can call it a hash function or call it something else, but really this function is one that the user is computing himself, but using the grid as an aid of sorts. All right, or the paper is an aid of sorts. It's like the paper kind of helps you calculate this function. It's not something that's calculated in software or hardware, but the user is actually calculating this function himself using the paper as an, as an assistant of some sort. All right. Now, obviously, when you have that, the function itself much it's, it's much more simple, right? If it's, it's something the user can do in his head or with the paper, you can't have as complex a function. And so, there's a bigger risk that someone who sees maybe even a few token values. Let's say somebody starts to see a few token values, they may be able to start inferring the remaining token values. All right, they may they may be able to kind of predict future values, which would obviously be a very bad thing um, if if they didn't have the actual paper itself. But they can compute future values based on previous values that would compromise the security of the other scheme, or of the entire scheme for that matter. So if you were to do let's say a paper based scheme, this becomes I think a very very real risk. You, you have you've lowered the complexity of the of the function. And as such, you have now potentially made it something that can be compromised more readily by an adversary. All right. And so as a result, you now may have to actually update or you may have to distribute this more frequently. You can't use the same paper for too long because maybe if you use it for, you know, 10 or 15, maybe 20 passwords or, or 20 instances of, of logging in, that may be enough for an adversary to go ahead and break the, break the security. So you may need to update the paper very frequently, maybe every week, every couple of weeks something of that nature. And now you have to worry about usability issues that, are, that have been reintroduced. In particular, you've got to worry about the possibility that the user does not have the right version of the paper. All right, hopefully that made some sense. And, and again, you know, these are variations on doing two-factor authentication. They all have their benefits and, and their drawbacks. Uh, but I think these are things you have to consider if you were to, let's say, design a scheme like this or implement a scheme like this or, or you know, consider using a scheme like this from somebody else.